So when you're hosting a database, for example, a Postgres database, there are different ways to do it. Some ways are a little bit more secure than other ways. And I wanted to talk about one of the more secure ways for you all so you guys can learn something from it. At work, we are investigating using RDS to migrate a little bit of our data off of Dynamo. We're just running into some friction using Dynamo. We think RDS would be a better solution for our project. And in trying to do so, I had to spin up an RDS Postgres instance. And more specifically, we need to use VPCs to protect the database from public access. So the point of this video is to give you a complete overview of what a VPC is, what a subnet is, what a security group is, what a cedar block is, just so you understand some of the stuff because it can be a little bit overwhelming when you're first trying to do this stuff in AWS. And since I just spent like the past week trying to set this all up in Terraform, I figured, hey, let's just make a video to teach people about it. So we need a database. So we are going to go ahead and just put a database here. And in our case, we're saying Postgres RDS. Okay. Now the approach a lot of people take when they're dealing with their database is they just allow this to be publicly accessible by everyone on the internet, which you could argue is not very secure, right? This is open to brute force attacks and other types of attacks because everyone can just try to hit your database URL because it's public and potentially do some bad things with it. So a more secure approach is you put it behind something called a VPC. And I'm going to go ahead and just denote that with like a dotted line here. And we'll just say VPC. So VPC, which stands for Virtual Private Cloud, is a way to basically isolate services in your AWS account. I'm going to be specifically talking about AWS here because that's what I'm using at work. But I guarantee other cloud providers have the same type of thing. All right, so we have a VPC that needs to wrap your database. But when you do this, it's no longer accessible to the internet. So once you have a VPC, and uh, typically this is region based, so I'll just say east here so we can kind of denote that. You have to create something called a subnet so that when you try to spin up your service, your service can obtain like a private IP that's used to designate how to access it in your VPC. Okay, because every machine needs an IP, right? So the, the private cloud has like its own thing called a subnet. So let's just go ahead and add a subnet here. And we are going to say, we'll do a private subnet. Now, when you're designating a private subnet, one thing that you might see is you have to designate something called a cedar block. So in our case, we're going to say like 10 dot, you know, zero dot six dot zero slash 32. So when it comes to a private subnet, typically you have to provide a cedar block, which is basically a range that designates like what IPs can exist in here. I'm going to change this to 24, not 36. And so to kind of explain this, let's just go and copy this. I'm going to go to cedar.xyz and I'm going to paste this in. Okay. And so what this is, is basically you're giving like a fixed prefix to the subnet. And you're saying that you will allow the last eight bits of this IP address to be configurable. Okay. So if it looks like this, for example, we're saying we need to allow 256 different machines that can live on this cedar block. Okay. And the higher this is, the less machines you're going to allow. So like, let's say we do 31. Well, then you can only have two machines living on this block. You could do 30 and then you'd have four. 29, you have eight, and then it just, you know, keeps going up powers of two. So typically you do like 24 or you could do 16 if you wanted to, which gives you a lot of potential machines that could live on this block. But what we're going to do is we're going to give it a 24. And then for every single subnet, you can just like change it so that you can get another 256 machines. Okay. And these are arbitrary. I'm just picking like five and six, just so we can kind of have something to talk about. But going back over here, this is our cedar block for this private subnet. So when this RDS instance spins up, what we can do is we can say, you know what, we want to attach this to the subnet. The subnet is attached to this VPC, but still nothing can really access it. Now, one thing I want to point out with a private subnet is that other things that live on the same subnet technically can just access the other services directly. If they, if they know the right IP of this, so for example, if I give this like a 10.0.6.23, which Maybe that's just randomly assigned if you're you know, trying to spin it up in AWS. Sometimes you don't really have control over that. Um, and then when you try to spin up a Lambda, you can also attach it to a VPC. 
and you can give it a subnet as well. And so this will might get randomly assigned a 54. And behind the scenes, like, you know, AWS is going to create a bunch of these. So it might like use up a lot of the IPs on your block. But these things should be, be able to communicate with each other pretty easily when they're inside the same private subnet. But there's also something else that we can add to our machines called security groups. So let's just go ahead and do this. We are going to put another box. This will be a bunch of boxes within boxes in this video. But we'll have a security group, which I'm just going to say like SG of P for Postgres. And then we're going to add another one for SG of L for Lambda. Okay. And so in AWS, a security group, you can specify what machine IP addresses or what cedar blocks can have access to this thing. So for example, on the RDS instance, we could say, we don't want anyone to access this unless they have this specific IP. Or you can say, we don't want anyone to access this unless they have a range that looks like this. But something that you can also do in AWS is you can say, I don't want anything to access this unless they have a security group that's coming from Lambda. So you can actually have security groups like depend on other security groups so that these two things can actually communicate with each other. Okay, so now they can communicate no problem and they also have this extra layer of security around the instance itself so that you can actually control like what machines inside this private subnet can actually talk to each other. All right, so now that we cover the basics of a VPC and subnets and cedar blocks and security groups, now we have to allow this Lambda to talk to the outside world because right now it can't. There's no way for the outside world to either talk to the Lambda or vice versa. Same with Postgres. There's no way for the outside world to get to Postgres, which is good. But how do you run migration scripts, right? You need a way to still connect to your Postgres instance so you can run migrations or you can maybe do some data in Elix. And one way you can do that is by spinning up something called a Bastion host or like a, a tunnel machine. So let's draw yet another box and we are going to go ahead and make this a public subnet. Okay. And we typically have to change what this would be. So you could just pick whatever you want. I'll just do a five here, whatever. Maybe there's some common convention um, that a better DevOps engineer could talk about, but I'm just going to pick it as a five. And inside of this subnet, we're going to create something called a NAT. So this is an NAT. Okay. A NAT is basically a machine that allows public internet access to route. If I were to zoom out a little bit, it's getting a little crazy. We can have the internet come in and out of this public subnet. And then you can also wrap this thing in a security group. So let's just do this. We'll just say security group of the NAT. And then you can technically say that this allows this security group to talk to it. You can also have the security group of the Lambda allow the security group of the NAT to communicate. And when you do that, that means that you can basically have your Lambdas reach out and do like fetch requests to the internet which sometimes you're going to want to do. For example, in our application, we needed the Lambdas to be able to talk to Dynamo, but Dynamo lives outside in the internet, so you have to basically allow it to do something like this. Now, just for the sake of it, the NAT would also have like an IP, right? Like this will just be randomly assigned and it will match whatever block that you have. So I just pick like 100 slash 24 or something. Uh, that could be the IP of it. But again, how do you run migration scripts? There's no way to actually like from your machine or from a CI CD pipeline, like you can't get to this Postgres instance unless you're actually like in the subnet trying to connect to the database. So one thing you can do is create something called a bastion host. Uh, and we will just call this like an EC2 instance. And this could just have whatever IP. Again, these IPs will probably just be randomly assigned. I'm just putting them for educational purposes. Now, looking at this diagram, you probably don't want your Postgres to ever communicate with a NAT because, I mean, like, why would you make it publicly accessible? That was the whole point of this. So probably just having the Lambdas have public access is the point there. Bear with me. I just swapped the diagram, so it's a little less confusing. Um, but we're going to wrap this in a security group once again. And then we're going to go ahead and just put, like, a security group of you know, EC2 or just say E. And again, this is something called, like, a Bastion machine. So, like, for example, you could have your laptop it have like some random IP here. Okay, this is your laptop or this is your CI CD pipeline. And again, you need to run migration scripts over this Postgres instance. So you could have this security group allow access from a very specific IP. And what this allows you to do is that you can set up an SSH tunnel. So 
So like you can go here and tunnel into this box, which allows you to basically talk to this database directly. And again, you'd have a security group set up between your Postgres instance and your Bastion host so that the only thing that can ever talk to this Postgres, um, like from the public internet, is this EC2 instance. And this is something that you could easily just turn on and off. Like right before you run your migration scripts, turn on the access to your IP, run the migration scripts or run whatever you need, and then turn it back off. So that is kind of, um, so that is like a really high level overview of the things that you're going to need to understand when dealing with VPCs. You have the subnets, the private and the public subnets. Um, with the public subnets, typically these services will automatically get attached a public IP. So like this one will have a public IP attached to it, which I can just like pretend like we have one over here. I'll just call this like a 60. I know, I know some of this text is kind of small, but give me some grace. It's kind of hard to like get this all good. So that's setting up one VPC. Hopefully you guys understand some of the topics I talked about. Um, but at work, we have a requirement where we have to use multi-region. So how do you do multi-region? Because like I said, a VPC lives in a particular region. So you have to actually make a brand new VPC. Let's just go ahead and paste this. And we're going to say this is the West region. And you have to actually do a lot of the same stuff. Like you're going to have to bring over a NAT. You're going to have lambdas. Um, just go ahead and copy and paste all this. Now in our case, we just have the RDS instance living in one region with uh, multiple availability zones. We may have to come back and figure out how to do replicas so that we have a replica in both regions. Now the main difference I want to point out between the East and the West is that I'm actually going to add a one here, so that they have different subnets. Because what we're going to end up doing is we're going to create something called a VPC peer between them. Now what a VPC peer does is it allows these two VPCs, which are kind of completely different and isolated, to be able to act like it's one giant network. So another cool thing I want to point about VPC peering is that you can actually have VPCs from different Amazon accounts connected together. So if you have like multiple accounts, for some reason you need to join them, you can actually have a different VPC here, the so VPC other account, and you can go ahead and connect those together with peering. It's a little bit more complicated for like accepting that peering and stuff, but um, but just keep that in mind because sometimes you, maybe you have like data that's in a completely different AWS account from you know different clients needing to communicate with each other, or they have services that need to talk to each other, or data that they need to ingest from somewhere else. You can just create a VPC peer and then give them access to that one location where they can talk to that machine, um, and it just gives you more fine grained control over who exactly you're giving access to your systems because just making stuff publicly accessible, which granted is what a lot of people probably do on their small little side projects with Postgres, but on a larger system with higher security needs, typically this is what you're gonna end up seeing. It's like you need to be able to lock down these machines and know exactly who and what is trying to log into them. Something that's very important to point out is that anytime you have like public accessible internet to any of these machines, you better make sure that the logging is very good. So for example, on this Bastion host, you should probably make sure that anytime someone connects and runs commands from this host, you better be logging this um, because you don't want some random malicious person to try to get into this host, run some commands, and you want to be able to track that, okay, something bad happened, they connected to this and they ran some commands against our database. But uh, yeah, that's about the overview. Hope you guys enjoyed watching. Just wanted to make this because I did just spend some time at work getting this all set up and it's fresh in my mind. And I figured it would be really good to share with you all if you guys are getting into like AWS stuff or just like DevOps stuff or Terraform. Because again, this is like a lot of what I do at work. My channel is a little bit different. My channel, I do more like front-end development and Next.js stuff. So it's fun to be able to actually explain some of the stuff I do at work um, for you all. All right. That's about it. Have a good day. Happy coding.